Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at a brand new ARM-based single board computer from Kados. This is known as the Vim4. We've got some awesome upgrades here. If you've been following the single board computer market, it's been a bit stagnant. We've had a couple release and more are definitely on the way, but we haven't had many and it's great to see Kados releasing something new. This definitely looks promising given the new CPU they have here, and when it comes to the GPU, we should have some really good power because it's definitely an upgrade from the older Vim boards. We've got 8 CPU cores and 8 GPU cores with this, and as you can see, this does come pre-installed with a heatsink and a fan. But we do have some cases available because it's the same form factor as the Vim 2 and the Vim 3. There's actually one more connector here on the back, but the cases will fit with a little modification. Or if you're not going to use that connector, which is actually HDMI in, you don't have to use it at all. Checking out the I.O. from the left to the right, we've got one USB 2.0 port, a USB Type-C port, which unfortunately is only 2.0, but it does support PD quick charging. And this is how we're going to power the unit up. Full-size HDMI, gigabit Ethernet, and on the far right, we've got a full-size USB 3.0 port. Moving around to the back, this actually has an HDMI in port. It's micro HDMI, and this can be used to pass through, or if you're running something like Android or even Ubuntu, you could run a different device through this and screen capture from there. We've also got 40 GPIO pins back here, and the board itself does have two built-in high-definition microphones. Over here on this side, we do have some physical buttons, reset, function, and power button. Flipping the unit over, we do have an M.2 slot and a micro SD card slot, so we can boot from micro SD or we can boot from the internal eMMC storage, which just happens to be 32 gigabytes. So I do want to slam this inside of a case, and I've got the clear version here, but in the past for the Vim 3, I picked up another case and never really got around to using it. So I figured we'd go ahead and put the Vim 4 in here, and it's actually one of my favorite looking cases for any single board computer on the market. Unfortunately, the top is not aluminum, it is plastic, but uh, with all those accents on it, I think it looks really good. The Vim 4 does come with two antennas because we do have Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2. This will all go inside of the case, and once it's finished up, it looks something like this. And with the top plate here, we do have a removable strip so we can access the GPIO pins. But yeah, I mean, with the color accents here, I do think that this is one of the best looking cases on the market. Got some ventilation here for the built-in cooler and fan. And with no modification, we have access to all the ports except for the micro HDMI input on the rear. We can cut that out pretty easily with a little X-Acto knife, but I'm going to leave it covered up because personally I'm not going to be using it at this time. And here's a quick size comparison between the Vim 4 inside of the case and the Raspberry Pi 4. Not much bigger with the case, and it is a smaller board when it's outside of the case. So when it comes to the specs of the Vim 4, we have the brand new Amlogic A311D2. This is an 8-core ARM CPU. We've got four A73 cores at 2.2 GHz and four A53 cores at 2 GHz. Really, when it comes down to it, the newest addition to this Amlogic CPU is the GPU, coming in with a Mali G52 MP8 up to 800 megahertz. You get 8 gigabytes of LPDDR4X RAM running at 2,112 megahertz. This comes with 32 gigabytes of onboard eMMC storage. We've got that M.2 slot, micro SD card, built-in Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2. It'll decode up to 8K at 24P, AV1, H265, VP9. It supports Dolby Vision, HDR10 and 10+, HLG, and Prime HDR. And when it comes to the operating systems available at the time of making this video, we can opt for Ubuntu 22.04 with the GNOME desktop, or you can go with the server version, and Android 10. There will be more down the line as soon as the community gets their hands on this. So upon first boot, you're going to be presented with the OWOW wizard, or the OWOW wizard. I'm just going to call it OWOW. From here, it makes it really easy to set up an operating system. It's an online installer. You can use Ethernet or Wi-Fi. I'm going to go with Ethernet because I already have it plugged in, but you can set up Wi-Fi through Easy Wi-Fi. It's going to scan for new operating systems available for this board. And as you can see, we've got Android 11, we've got Ubuntu 20.04 with GNOME, and we've got Server. I'm going to install Ubuntu 20.04 with the GNOME desktop first. We're going to take a look at that, and then we'll move over to Android. But it's really easy to do. I'm connected over Ethernet. I'm going to choose OK. It's going to download the operating system for me. Once it's finished downloading, we'll choose Install. It's going to install to the internal eMMC storage. You can use an M.2 if you want to, but I'm going to go with the internal eMMC. 
And once this is done, we can boot right into that operating system. I just happen to choose Ubuntu 22.04 with the GNOME desktop. All right, so I've had a little time to mess around with Ubuntu on the Vim 4, and it's pretty quick. Uh, it's a little bare bones coming out of the box, but it's easy enough to get everything you need installed. This does work really well with that new GPU, and real quick, the first thing I did was just run a quick sysbench. This does prime up to 10,000. We're right there at 10 seconds. On the Raspberry Pi, the lowest score I've ever been able to get with an overclock was 36 seconds. So when it comes to the CPU side of things, it's definitely got the Pi 4B. And uh, yeah, even with the GPU, we definitely have much better performance here, but this board is gonna come in a little more expensive than the Raspberry Pi 4. I did have to manually install the software center, but I've got a few applications installed here. And one of the main things I noticed was uh, just how quick the web browser is. I installed Chromium, and everything loads up really quickly. So just head over to the Kados website. Web browsing on this, even like it sits right out of the box in early phases, is pretty quick. I mean, this does feel really good. Next thing I wanted to take a look at was a little bit of YouTube video playback just from the Chromium browser. I personally haven't tested Firefox just yet. Yeah, let's do 1080 right now. We'll go for Stats for Nerds. And it looks like we've already got a few drop frames here. Kind of expected with early software on these boards, it really always happens like this. I just installed Super Tux Cart from the software center to test it out, just to see what it would do. We've got a little 3D game here. Not too intensive, but as you can see, it is struggling a bit to run this game right now. And this is one of the main reasons I wanted to get into Android with this board. Still pretty early for Ubuntu, and like I mentioned, this does happen a lot with these single board computers. But over time, once the community gets their hands on it and a few different distros are released, we'll get much better performance on this chip. I'm pretty sure of it. What I'm going to do now is wipe the internal storage and install Android. I will come back to Ubuntu in another video. I definitely want to get some more stuff out of the way, but I wanted to see how Android acted here because when it comes to early single board computers, in my experience, about 99% of these single board computers do perform much better with Android over a desktop Linux operating system system right out of the box in these early stages. So I'm going to go ahead and get that installed real quick. We've got Android 10. Unfortunately, there's no Google Play at the time of making this video. And I've run into another issue here. It's actually a pretty big one in my opinion, given that this is a 64-bit CPU. This version of Android is only running in 32-bit mode, which means there's a lot of applications that I really wanted to test on here, like Genshin Impact and EtherSX2 for PS2 emulation, that just won't even install. Hopefully this is fixed in the next few releases because I got a good feeling this would handle high-end emulation and higher-end Android games pretty well, but we can't really install them because they're mostly all 64-bit. Still, I was able to install Aptoid and get a few native Android games that we're going to test out and some emulation like PSP and Dreamcast. But before we move over there, let's head up to settings because we do have these Vim 4 settings here that are specific to this board. So from here, we can change the resolution, sound output, HDMI in, and we've got a cooling fan control. We can go to automatic, level one, two, or three. But, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, I actually think this HDMI in is pretty cool to see on a single board computer. If I go up to HDMI in, basically what this is going to do is pass through to this screen. So if I had something plugged into that micro HDMI port on the Vim 4, we could display it right here. And in turn, you could actually use a screen recorder to capture the screen. Pretty cool little feature I want to experiment with in the future, but let's check out some 4K video playback. I'm using YouTube Vance because we don't have Google Play services, and I'll jump right into a video here. So from the YouTube settings, I've got Stats for Nerds on, I've got this set to 4K. But as you can see where it says Viewpoint, 3840 by 2160, it's stating it's false. We're actually only running this at 1440p. Like I mentioned, from the settings in YouTube Vance, we're set to 4K and the screen resolution of the Vim 4 is also at 4K, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on. And one thing I didn't mention yet is the Vim 4 actually has a gyro built in. It's really not meant for playing games like this. It's actually meant for this thing to be strapped to like a robot or something and you can use that gyro. But I'm gonna test it out here with a native Android game. Seems to actually work pretty decently. So yeah, it is working. You know, I wouldn't want to play every single game like this, but it's still pretty cool just to have that gyro built into the SPC itself. And as you can see, it is working in Android. And by the way, this game is running amazingly. 
I test this on a lot of lower end single board computers and when you test it on a lower end chip it kind of detects it, lowers the resolution, but with this we're at least at 1080p and it's definitely running at full speed. I've got another Android game to test here. So PUBG works on 64-bit systems or 32, and I don't have a controller connected, so it is a bit funky, but I've got a mouse and keyboard here. So I'm using the on-screen touch keys here along with the mouse and the keyboard for movement. And the way I got this set up right now is high settings and the frame rate is set to maximum. This is playable on the Vim 4. PUBG actually works really well. I cannot wait to get a 64-bit operating system so we can test out Genshin Impact. I think we could run that game at low settings 60 FPS and have a really good time with it. And finally here, I've got a little bit of emulation. I definitely wanted to test some higher end emulators like the Dolphin emulator for GameCube and Ether SX2 for PS2, but those are both 64-bit applications. I could go with an older version of Dolphin which will work on 32, but the updates aren't there with that and this is a newer chip. I kind of wanted to be fair with it, so I'll just wait till we get a 64-bit version of Android so I can test that out. But when it comes to Dreamcast emulation using ReDream or Flycast, you're going to be good to go. I'm upscaled to 1080p here and it's running at full speed. And finally, about the highest end emulator I can test in 32-bit mode is PSP using PPSSPP. The resolution of the operating system where the UI resolution is set to 4K, so it's a bit hard to see that FPS counter up in the top right hand corner. But here we have Ghost of Sparta, Vulcan back in, 3x resolution, it looks really good on this screen here, and it's running at 60. Every once in a while we do get a dip into the mid 50s, but that's kind of the way it goes with this game. Overall, PSP emulation is working really well given how early it is for this chip. When it comes to the Vim 4, we've got a pretty powerful little ARM CPU here with a nice GPU. I can't wait till some more updates to both of these operating systems are out so we can take a better look at how everything's going to function on this board. But I think this would turn out to be a really powerful little single board computer as soon as the right community developers get their hands on this thing. And once we get a 64-bit version of Android for this, I will do another video and we'll test out some high-end emulation and some more high-end native Android gaming because uh, with what we have here, I think it'll do a pretty good job. But that's going to wrap it up for my first look at the Kados Vim 4. If you're interested in learning more, I will leave a couple links in the description. If you have any questions, or if there's anything else you specifically want to see running on this board in the next video, let me know in the comments below. And like always, thanks for watching.